Welcome to our discussion on multiplying and dividing decimal numbers. So we need to remind ourselves that decimal numbers are really just fractions in disguise, right? So 0.5 is 5 tenths, 0.85 is 85 one hundredths, and so on and so forth. So when we're really taking 0.5 times 0.3, we're really taking 5 tenths times 3 tenths, and we know when we multiply fractions, you multiply the top to get 15, you multiply the bottom to get 100, so you get 15 over 100, which is 0.15. Now, we know that if two numbers are both smaller than 1, their product will always be smaller than 1. So it makes sense that it got smaller at this point. Well, there is, you know, a much easier way to do this because converting everything into fractions and then doing the fraction multiplication and then putting it back into a decimal, that's just overly complicated. The easier way to multiply two decimal numbers is to just treat them as if they were whole numbers. Basically, take the decimals out, do the multiplication, and then bring the decimals back in at the end. And there's a really easy uh, kind of recipe for how this is done. So 3.2 becomes 32, 0.41 becomes 41, we do 32 times 41 using, you know, our regular uh, multiplication, adding everything together, right? You know, you know, 1 times 2 and blah, 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 and you get 13, 12. Well, now all you have to do is count up how many decimal digits we have. Remember, decimal digits just means the digits to the right of the decimal. So we had 1 here, we had 2 here, so we have a total of 3 of them. So we need a total of 3 of them here, which means the decimal place goes boink right there in between the 1 and the 3. So it's that simple. Multiplying these things, you just turn them into normal numbers, do the multiplication, move the decimal at the end. So again, 0.3 times 0.2 becomes 6. Two decimals, we need two decimal places, so we have to move this twice, which would go 1 and then 2, and you go, uh-oh, we've got to add a 0 in there, right? So to move it two places, you got to have that little 0 in front of it. So sometimes you're going to have to squeeze some zeros in there when you move it you know, further than you have digits to play with. All right, so no matter how big the numbers get, um, the process doesn't change. 4,302 times 1,205, you do all the work, you get this big, huge number, but you had one, two, three, four, five decimal digits, so you move over five times, right? You count out one, two, three, four, five decimals, Put the decimal point there, and there's your answer, 51. And then check yourself, 12 times 4 is 48. So it makes sense that our answer is, a, is basically a number of tens, right? It wouldn't make sense if it was 480 or 4. I'm sorry, it wouldn't make sense if it was 518 or 5.18. It should be on that same power of 10. 48 is on a power of 10 to the 1, 51 is on a power of 10 to the 1. So they should be in that same magnitude is, is one way of thinking about it. Um, of course, if you're using calculators, it does all this for you, so that's nice. Um, when you're given a number in items per unit, and, the, and the, uh, multiply these two quantities to find the total numbers of items. So for instance... Um, they've got a base pay of this per hour plus time and a half. If they worked this many hours per work per week, and you want to know what their salary is, then obviously per means division. Um, and so this is what I always tell my students that helps them kind of understand what's going on. Twenty-one dollars per hour. You can really think of it as uh, twenty-one point four six, and here's dollars. But then per one hour. So if you want to figure out what their total money is, you need to get rid of the hours, right? You need to just have an answer that's in minutes. So we need to multiply this thing by some hours. Well, what do we have in the question that tells us what those hours are? Well, it tells us 46.5. So we put in that 46.5 hours. And like any other fraction, if you have something on the top and bottom of a fraction, it cancels out. And now my answer is going to be in just money, right? Because I still have the dollar symbol there. So 21.46 times 46.5 would give me that, um, that answer in dollars. But we have to remember that we don't want to multiply by 
46.5 because their rate is 2146 for just the first 40 hours. So we would make this 40 instead. Do that math, right? And get how much their regular pay is. So here it is, that much. And then have to take the pay that they got, multiply it by 1.5, because that's what it means to have time and a half. This is how much money they get per hour when they work more than 40 hours. And then we redo that whole multiplication of that rate times the time, which in this case is the six and a half overtime hours, to get that amount of money. And then we add them together, and that's how much they make with all of that overtime. Okay, so that big long example was just reminding you that when you have um, units of measure, you always have to take into account those units of measure. You have to make sure that you keep your units of measure accurate. And the easiest way to do that is to stick it all on the conversion line, that big, huge fraction bar, and just keep your units in the right places. Just remember that anytime you see the word per, that unit of measure goes in the bottom of the fraction because per denotes division. So it's something divided by, right? So miles per hour is miles divided by hours and so on and so forth. Division of decimal numbers is very similar to division of whole numbers. You could stack them in a fraction and then all you have to do is multiply it by uh, enough powers of 10 to get rid of all the decimals. In this example, they both only have one decimal, so you multiply top and bottom by a power of 10, you get 68 over 17, and then you do your typical long division with 68 over 17. Well, what happens if one of them has more decimals than the other? Well, it doesn't change things. You still just have to um, you know, multiply by powers of 10 to get all of the decimals gone. So for instance, this one, 1 1.38 divided by 2.4. Well, I need it twice, right? I need it to multiply by 100 to get rid of this one, so I need to multiply this one by 100. So we're moving the decimal place twice for both of them if we want to set it up as a fraction. Well, if we just want to go straight to long division, we don't have to worry about that. We can divide a whole number into a decimal number. So if you want to go straight to long division and um, ignore the step of putting it into a fraction, then all you have to do is make your divisor, right, the thing that you're doing the dividing with, the thing to the right of the little division symbol, make that a whole number. So you here you set it up normally. You need to make this a 24, so you move its decimal place once, but to be you know equal and balanced, you got to move this one as well. So now you're doing 24 into 13.8, and you go ahead and you do your long division. But again, we've got technology. We can use technology to do all this for us. Um, but it's nice to know that a simple process does exist if we ever had to do these things by hand. Um, there are some tricks of the trade for division, and they're similar to the, the things with um, multiplying by certain numbers. And it really comes back to uh, powers of 10. <clears throat> if you're dividing by 5, you know that 5 is half of 10. So the easiest thing you can do is multiply the number by 2 and then divide that result by 10, right? If you multiply by 2 and divide by 10, you're basically multiplying by 2 over 10, 2 tenths, which reduces to 1 fifth. And if you're multiplying by 1 fifth, you're basically dividing by 5, right? So it's just kind of a roundabout way to do division. And again, this is really only if we have to do mental math. If we're going to do things in calculators, we're just going to throw them into our calculator. So the same thing comes you know, with other things that are kind of portions of powers of 10. 25 is a fourth of 100. So take your number, multiply it by, if you have to divide by 25, then take that number, multiply it by 4, and then divide that answer by 100, which means you just have to you know, move the decimal place two times. Uh, if you want to divide by uh, 20, you can first divide by 2 and then Move the decimal place over by 1, i.e. divide by 10. So you're looking for factors of powers of 10 or multiples of powers of 10. And either of those make division by hand really, really easy. Now, we've talked about this before, that division is really just asking the question, how many of something are in something else? 
So how many of x are in y means x is the divisor and y would be the dividend. Well, again, who cares about vocabulary, but it just helps you to set up which number goes where. How many pieces of plywood this thick are in a stack 30 inches high? So we know that if we're looking for how many of this are in this, then we're dividing 0.375 into 30 and we set it up this way. It's also kind of intuitive if you've gone the other way and did try to do 30 into 0.375, you would have got a decimal number which would have been less than one. You'd say, well, how can I have less than one sheet of plywood? I must have messed something up. And that's the nice thing about word problems. Students fear word problems, but it gives you a real world connotation that can help you not make simple, easy mistakes of putting things in the wrong order. So A per B Remember, per always means division. So A per B means A divided by B. And so now you know you're, you're putting B into A, right, if you want to use the long division. But it means A divided by B. Per always means division. Okay, rounding decimal numbers. There are some, I'll say guidelines, because they're not rules. You don't have to always follow them. But there are some things that are defined. Like if you want to round to the nearest thousandth, well, you have to remember what the thousandth place is, right? Tens, hundreds, thousandths. It's the third decimal. So we want to take um, this number and round it to the nearest thousandth. Well, that's the last number. And so if we going to use that, there's nothing left to it. But if we want to round it to the nearest hundredth, then we're going to look at the thousandth place. And that two is going to tell us to round down to just the 6. And so our number ends in 0.46. So the rule is, you know, the same for rounding decimals as it is for rounding whole numbers. And that is, if the number to the right of where you want to round to is 5 or bigger, you round up. And if it's less than 5, you round down. The only thing that you have to add when we're doing decimals is you have to remember what the heck these words are, right? Where is the hundreds place? Where is the thousands place? Where is the tens place? And so on, and so on, and so on. Um, sometimes the process of dividing will never result in a zero remaining remainder, meaning that you get repeating decimals. And when you get repeating decimals, oftentimes you have to just kind of call it quits and round. So for instance, if you did this division, it's going to keep going on and on. So what we're going to do is, because you'll notice here, 20 divided by 18 goes in 1, and it has a, a, a remainder of 2. We're going to bring down a 0, which is going to give us 20 again. We're going to divide by 18 again, which is going to give us 1, right? Because 18 going at one time, with another remainder of 2. And this process will go on and on and on. So this is going to be 0.6111111111. Just going to keep going. So we have to stop that somewhere. We could stop it at 2.611, 2.6111, right? Because it's always going to stop with a 1 because the next digit is a 1. So it will always just round back down to 1. But we could also round it all the way back to point, you know, 2.6. It just depends on how accurate you need to be. So then we would put in this little approximation symbol, right? The squiggly equals means approximately equals, so we know that we did some rounding. Well, you might ask yourself, well, how do we know how far to round? How do we know when we round to 0 0.6 versus 0 0.61? Well, we let the question dictate um, what we're going to do. So obviously something like this we don't have to worry about because they're whole numbers, but let's look at something else and figure out what we're going to uh, round to to get our level of accuracy and it comes down to how many decimal places we have what's the most accurate decimal place you know in this equation here this this operations that we're doing we have two decimal places so at the end our answer should be rounded to two decimal places now it, it could come out that we have less than that but it could come out that we have more than that and we have to round so we would round back down to two. Now, if if we didn't have to round, right, if our answer came out um, without a repeating decimal, then we would mostly repeat, or sorry, report all the decimals. But again, sometimes, even with non-repeating decimals, we're asked to round back down to the level of accuracy that we had in that 
you know, formula or in that situation. Okay, averages are no different with decimal numbers than they are with everything else. We know to find an average, you add everything up, divide by how many you are. So if you have decimal numbers, you just add them all up and divide by how many you are. Nothing changes. But again, you might ask yourself, well, oh crap, I got this repeating decimal. Now what do I do? Well, my original set of data had four decimal places, so my answer should have four decimal places. And that's really what I'm meaning about the level of accuracy comes from you know what is there. So here's another example where we've got decimals. Uh, we get the average, and um, we would round to... Some people argue that you round to the smallest level of accuracy, so you'd round to one, but a lot of times the rule is you round to the highest level of accuracy. You just have to pay attention to what you're asked to do. Um, last example is really just dealing with some money, right? Um, and... Again, we're just going to be multiplying by these decimal numbers. We're going to be getting some decimal answers. We're going to be adding some decimal answers. We're going to sum all that up, divide by how many things we have. We get an answer with you know decimals that keep going on and on. But because our answer is supposed to be in money, we would, of course, round that to the nearest penny because that's as low as our money goes. And then it would be 3.95. So sometimes the context of the question will also dictate what you round to. And that's all I've got for you.